So it's been some time since the last video. So what? Is the printer dead? Did I finally drown in a sea of benches? Or did my chronic exposure to styrene finally cause me to sleep in an 8 month long coma? Well, after one and a half years I can say with tears to my eyes and deep, deep hate for the Clipper config reference that the Tesseract project has finally come to an end. So let's break down this long awaited and much forsaken end of this journey. Now, because it has been so long since the last update and due to a year of troubleshooting, almost everything from that video has changed. So instead of talking about the electronics, which was the next planned part, I believe it would be much better to break the printer down in all its basic aspects and talk a bit about all of them. Now, I know that everyone wants to hear about tool changing, but because my viewer attention has hit rock bottom, I will save that till the end. For now, let's talk about all the mechanical aspects. So, let's begin where it all started. No, 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 not there! The segment is a bit of a lousy beginning, since the frame hasn't really changed that much since the video about it. It is mostly comprised of 33 aluminum extrusions and aluminum corners. Using extrusions to make building a custom frame really easily, since all you need is the aluminum, T-nuts, corners, and the miter saw. After you have cut all the extrusions to the right size, and cleaned up all of the aluminum chips from your hair, you can use the corners to put the frame together almost like an adult Lego set. Normally, aluminum extrusion frames are light due to the cut of the extrusions, but considering the 30-30 size and the fact that a Napoleon-sized human could fit in it, the frame is actually not the lightest, and I believe that it would hurt if it were to fall on the toe. For the assembly, I use mostly sliding 30-30 T-nuts, which requires some planning ahead, because you can only put them in the front or the end of the extrusions. You could use drop-in T-nuts, but I believe for structured parts of the frame, sliding T-nuts are a better option. And also much cheaper for some reason. When the whole frame is built, you can use drop-in nuts, because taking the frame apart every time you want to add something is not a fun idea. Ask me how I know. In addition to the corners, aluminum brackets were placed on the outside of the frame for increased rigidity. Lastly, for this part, either the frame or the table that the frame is resting on should be screwed to the wall, because when working, the vibrations will leave a visible artifact on the prints. Now that we've talked about the frame, it's time to talk about the Strap down, because I feel like this will be a bit of a long one. So, if you remember from the last video, the Z-axis is comprised of three stepper motors that drive three lead screws, which in turn move the bed in a non-planar motion using a mix of linear and rotary bearings. So yeah, that whole system, out the window. It was overly complicated, lacked stability, and also I, or most of the people to be honest, would not bother to slice a file that would take advantage of this mechanic. So it's gone and with it a lot of the bed variance problems, which we will talk about more a bit later. Now, one of the biggest issues this printer has had, and what almost caused me to throw it out the window several times, is Z-banding. It was by far the most annoying issue diagnosed, and solving it took about 6 months and a complete redesign of all the axes. As far as the Z-axis is concerned, the lead screws didn't make the cut. Not only did I think they were the main source of the problem, they were also loud on moving the bed, and I wanted a more elegant solution. Now, let me introduce you to a segment which I will call blatantly ripping off the Voron 2.4. I decided that if I wanted to remove the lead screws and avoid ball screws, my only remaining option was belts. I have never built a Z-axis belt system, and at the time it was an exciting challenge. The design is very much inspired by the 2.4. You have three stepper motors which drive a 16 tooth pulley which with a small belt then drive an 80 tooth pulley which gives a 1 to 5 gear ratio. This in turn drives the 20 tooth pulley and the 10mm GT2 belt which moves the bed up and down on all the linear rails. Designing this system was rushed, because at that point it had already been a year since I started this project and I was feeling a bit burned out, so the parts, while functional, could be more aesthetically pleasing. But how well does it work? Well, the system is much faster and quieter than the old one, but it comes with a big downside that the bed needs tramming every time the steppers get disabled. This wouldn't be that big of an issue, but since the bed is huge, homing, tramming and doing a bed mesh can actually be a long procedure that lasts about 5 minutes, which might not sound like a lot, but you have to do this every time you start a print. A fix for this would be to use steppers with brakes or higher gearing, but that was not something that I was interested in spending money on at the time. But to answer the big question, did it fix the Z-banding? Actually, mostly yes. After switching to a belt-driven Z-axis, I could print models that I could not see the layer lines, which at that point was a huge win for me. Now, 
Let's talk about what the Z-axis actually moves. I will keep this part short, because not much has changed since the last video, which I talked about the heat beds. The heat bed is comprised of four heat plates that are connected together on an aluminum extrusion frame. They have a thermistor each and the ability to individually control them, giving you the option to only heat up a part of the bed if you don't need all the print area. On top of the beds, there is a magnetic PEI sheet which helps spread the heat on the cold spots between the beds and also helps with the bed adhesion. At this point, I will have to complain a bit about my PEI sheet. Originally, I bought a carbon glass plate from Creality for testing, but after, I realized that it wasn't all that good for this project. I spent a bit more and bought this 400 by 400 magnetic PEI sheet from Prima Creator, and for 120 euros, I must say I'm a bit disappointed. It really didn't fix the adhesion issues, and even PLA sometimes has a problem sticking to it at 60C, which I find odd and at times even frustrating. Rant over. As a last note for the haters, you know who you are, the bed variance on the whole 400 by 400 bed is 0.15 mm, which might seem like a lot, but considering the assembly and size of the bed, it is much less than I thought and more than enough. The heat beds are a bit underpowered for this, which means it can take some time to heat up, but after 4 to 5 minutes, they will reach 100 degrees Celsius with no problem. I think that's all I have to say for the beds for now. Why don't we talk about the. Originally, as you can see in the old video, the XY axis takes inspiration from Mirage's Hevort, which is an amazing printer, and if you are watching this video and don't know about it, you should definitely check it out, link in the description. It uses a 2020 extrusion for the X gantry and linear rails for both axes. As you can see, the belts are laid out in the core XY configuration, which has become all the more popular in recent printers. While it takes a significant number of idler pulleys and requires long belts, the upsides are very much worth it. A core XY system allows the movement of both axes with two stationary motors, which gives an advantage at higher speeds due to the reduced mass that has to move. Also, makes the cable management easier and gives a symmetric design to the XY system, which my eyes very much appreciate. Also, instead of the standard 6mm GT2 belts, 10mm belts were used, considering the application. The stepper motors are the same as the Voron 2.4x Stepper Online and are the same steppers that are on the Z axis. During Christmas, trying to solve the Z-banding problem, I decided to redesign the XY axis, and so I did in another segment of blatantly ripping off the Voron 2.4. As you can see, the motor mounts are, and x country blocks are very much inspired by the Voron, as well as the belt configuration. The belt tensioners have a bit of an overkill length and are kinda big, but it was necessary considering the printer size and the 10mm belts. The tool head will be discussed later when we talk about tool changing, but for now, all that matters is that the belts are all on one side of the tool head, the same side that the tool head mounts on the rail, and are attached with 3D printed belt locks. It used to have slot in locks, but when tensioning they used to pop up, so I switched to this system, which is much better, and with the tensioners, tensioning the belt correctly is a very easy procedure. The Y end stop is located here, and the X and Z is on the tool head. For Z to home, there mustn't be a tool head on, or else it risks crushing the nozzle on the bed. I think this is almost everything on the mechanical side of things except tool changing, well, everything except. This is going to be a kind of a small segment because there isn't all that much to say about an enclosure. Since the frame is built of extrusions, attaching plates for the enclosures is very easy with dropping T-nuts. The plates are a thin sheet of MDF. Shut up, shut up, I can hear you from back there. I know wooden 3D printing enclosures don't go well together, but honestly, at this size and with my manufacturing capabilities, this was the easiest option, and I've been running a wooden enclosure on my 3D printers without any issue, and what can I say, I like to live on the edge, apparently the edge of a burning cliff. The inside of the plates is lined with aluminum tape to reflect the heat inside the enclosure, and even though making them is a bit of a hassle, they have proven very liable to keep the heat in. The doors are made out of plexiglass with 3D printer hinges and handles, and locked to the frame with magnets, which make them easy to open, but hard to open accidentally. The outside of the NTF is painted black, and to cover all the triangle holes that had to be made for the frame plates, red 3D printed covers are glued on them. With all that, the printer is able to keep the heat in, and also makes it look much sexier in my opinion. Well, I think it's time we change engineering fields. This part is where I think I will get the most flack on, but I promise, I will try and give valid reasoning for all the dumb decisions. Well, valid at the time. So, after looking at this, you must be wondering a few things. First, how does anyone make sense of this ratsness of cables? Second, how high was I when I decided to put three huge power supplies here? And lastly, what in the hell is an Arduino doing there? So, to try and answer most of these, let's start from where the power comes in, which is right here. 
After that, it comes up to here, where it splits up to two things. This small 5V power supply and an emergency shutoff button. The power supply is there only for the Raspberry Pi, so it can be powered on even when everything else is off. After the emergency button, the power goes into this relay board here, and after that into this big boy power supplies. The relay board is there, so I can turn on the power supply sequentially. So, the inrest current doesn't trip my breaker, just like the load doing so much at the beginning, leaving me in the dark at night. All three power supplies are 24 volt, 500 watt units. This one here is responsible for heaters, steppers, fans, lights, etc. And the others are responsible for, you guessed it, the heat beds. So, as I said above, you must be asking, how much brain damage I must have to use DC power for such a big heat bed when I can use silicon heaters and wall power for much better performance? And that's a good question, which will sadly remain unanswered, for now. Now back to following cables. After the first power supply, the cables go to the main board. The board of choice for this printer was pretty obvious. I needed something with an insane amount of stepper driver slots, a lot of thermistor ports, lots of heater fans, and you needed to work well with Clipper, which was the printer software of choice. After not much looking around, I decided on the Octopus BDT 1.1 from Big Tree Tech. Since it's one of the boards of choice for Vorum printers, it has been thoroughly tested for Clipper and has enough I.O. to choke a horse. I mean, come on, Oromo refuses. The only thing missing from this board is the ability to use 48 volt for the steppers, but since I knew that with the tool changer I would never reach speeds that require, I didn't really care. But if you do, the Pro version has that and even more. Honestly, I have no bad things to say about this board, and working with it has been a joy. And how can you say no to a product that comes with a duck in the box? The stepper drivers that get slaughtered to the board are the very popular TMC2209 by Trinamic. If you are watching this video, you know about how good Trinamic drivers are and how unmatched their performance is, which is why they are used on every single mid to high printer build. On this board, almost everything else is connected. Steppers, heaters and stops. The only thing that are not run from here are the four heat beds, the screen, the camera and the servo that locks the tools. Let's shift our attention over to this weird cluster of things. The four things surrounding the center board are MOSFET boards, one for each bed. They are all connected to the 24V from the power supplies. Two MOSFET boards for each power supply. The board in the middle is a custom board that has a few jobs. Number one, it allows a heat bed signal to reach the MOSFET boards. One of the bed thermistors is connected to the main board to generate the signal, which is then passed onto the other bed, through the relays that the Arduino controls. It reads the rest of the beds, and if they are overheating or heating regularly, it shuts them all down. And lastly, it tells the servo to lock and unlock the tools from the Raspberry. For the Raspberry, two DSi cables go out, one for the touchscreen and one for the camera that looks at the print. The main board is also connected to the Raspberry via USB as well as the Arduino. Lastly, the enclosure has 24 volt white LED strips to light up the print area, which are connected directly to the power supply through a switch that is mounted under the screen, and there is a strip of WS2812Bs under the screen which act like a progress bar for aesthetic reasons. Now that we've talked about the hardware, it's time to talk about the software that's running all of it. So let's get to what runs all the hardware that we talked about. The brain behind the whole thing is a Raspberry Pi 3B+, running 32-bit main OS, which is a pre-built image based on Raspberry Pi OS that has a bunch of Clipper stuff pre-installed, like the Moonraker API, main cell, UI, Crow's Nest, and a bunch of other useful stuff. I won't get much into Clipper here, because there will be too much to talk about, and there are a lot of amazing videos about it. For my case, my config is pretty standard, with three Z-steppers, three extruders, configuration for the TMC drivers, Z-tilt adjust, bed mesh, and a bunch of other stuff. As I mentioned before, there is a 5-inch LCD touchscreen that is connected to the Raspberry Pi and with Clipper screen it is the main way I interact with the printer. Clipper hosts a web server that you can use with any browser, but I use it mainly for editing the config files and uploading G-code. Everything else I do is done with the LCD. Let's talk about talking to the Arduino for a minute. From the Raspberry Pi side, I look for a way you have Clipper talk to Python, but with minimal results. In the end, I created macros that turn GPIO pins on and off, and a Python script is responsible for reading pins that are directly shorted to those pins that Clipper control with jumpers. Said script reads the pins, and based on their activation, it sends via serial to the Arduino a command that either locks, unlocks the tool, or enables the beds. On the Arduino side, once it receives the serial command, it parses it and either turns the relays on or off for the bed, or locks and unlocks the tool respectively. The Arduino is also responsible for reading the thermocouples from the beds, and if it detects overheating or irregular heating, it will disable them. I will talk a bit later about the necessity of this board. Also, there is a Raspberry camera with focus mounted in the enclosure that uses crow's nest and lets me check a print without being there. 
Lastly, the LED strip progress bar I mentioned uses Digital Ninja's LED clipper macros, which I will also link in the description. It's time we talk about what everyone's been waiting for, tool changing. So, mechanics first. My tool changing setup is very similar to the recently cancelled E3D tool changer. A moment of silence for our fallen comrade. On the tool head, there is a high-tech HS645MG servo. On it is a 5 to 4mm coupler, and on that coupler, after a small 4mm ID bearing, is mounted the key, which locks the tool in place. The plate that locks the tool is fully 3D printed and has a Maxwell kinematic coupler that locks the tool in the XY direction, and the key is responsible for locking it in the Z. The way I made my key is a bit unconventional. On the end is a 4mm to 4mm coupler which I drilled two of the grub screw threads in so I can pass a small rod through which I then soldered in place. After a lot of sanding and cleaning, the key looked pretty good and so far hasn't failed yet. On the tool side, there is a 3D printed plate that mounts on the Hemera and on it a keyhole with two ramps that get screwed on. It being screwed on means that replacing it is easy considering the wear that it will endure after thousands or even tens of thousands of tool changes. Also, it allows it to be printed in a different orientation than the mounting plate. So, let's talk about the three tools. The first is a Revo Hemera, and the other are normal Hemeras, all with 0.4mm nozzles. For part cooling, I use Rene Jurax, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, a Hemera fan deck with the 5015 blower fans. When it comes to cable management, I use a 50mm cable sheath with zip ties to a mount so they don't get in the way of each other when swapping tools. Each tool has its own cradle that it's mounted on. For the tools to mount securely to the cradle, three magnets are used along with two screws to lock the tool in all axes. After finding all the parts in position, this system, despite all the plastic parts, holds the tools really well and after using the printer with it and without it, it makes not much of a difference to the print quality, although without it, it could reach much higher speeds and accelerations without the fear of the tool flying off while printing. So, time to talk about the software. To be honest, I had no clue where to even begin with the software. Thankfully, as it goes with these kinds of projects, most of the work was already done by someone much smarter than me. Enter Type QXQ's Clipper Tool Changer plugin. Well, yes, learning it and setting it up correctly did take a long time, it was well worth it. I won't talk much about the setup now, because I am planning to make a video about setting up tool changers on Clipper at some point, but to summarize, I made a config file about the tools, which described parking positions, extruders, cooling fans, and also Clipper macros for tool pickup and drop off. Homing with the printer is a bit of a weird procedure, because as I said above, the Z switch and probe is on the tool head, thus it cannot home or calibrate the bed with the tool head locked. So I set up a macro that does the following. Homes the X and Y axis, drops off the current tool if one is attached, homes the Z, trams the bed, calibrates the bed mesh, and if a tool had been attached, it picks it back up. On the slice side of things, Prusa Slicer was an obvious choice for its great tool changer support and for being the most feature-rich and well-supported slicer at this point. So, while all might seem good, there are definitely improvements that would make this printer better. First and most importantly are the heat beds. While the 4 heat plate solution works, it is not the best of solutions. It takes a long time to heat up, makes a less than perfect tool plate and requires the big DC power supplies. A better solution would be a mixed 6 aluminum tool plate with a silicon heater. It will heat up much faster, be more efficient and take much less space. Improvement 2. While the tool changer works well, the servo that holds the tools is under a lot of stress, and being above the plate also heats it up. Thus, I would expect it not to last that long. In the future, I would like to design a system like the Prusa XL that has no motor on the head and uses the XY steppers to lock the tools, but at the moment, I want to be done with this project for now. Also, while I like the Hemeras, I wouldn't use them in the tool changer. If I had to choose all over again, I would make a custom tool head with a small extruder, which means I would be able to fit them much closer to each other, which would allow me to fit more if I wanted to. Lastly, the Arduino expansion board does not have to be there. The reason it was there in the first place is because instead of the servo, the tool changer used to have a small stepper to lock the tools, but that was replaced. The main board can control servos out of the box, and it will be much easier to just connect the servo there. And if you also upgrade the bed, there is no reason for the relays, thus the whole board becomes useless. I think that's all I have to say about this project right now. After one and a half years, I can finally do something else with my life. I do apologize that this video took so long to put out, but I've been really busy, and this printer has been a pain troubleshoot. While working on this, the number one comment I have received is people asking about STL or design files to make, the, to make the printer. And to all those people, I have to say, are you okay? Do you need a friend?
This printer costs over 1.5k in parts alone. For this cost, you get a printer that are faster, more accurate, and don't need a semester to put together. This printer was designed by me for my uses, a big multi-material printer that leaves nothing on the table. If after all that, you are still interested in embarking on a torturous journey, I'll provide STLs, configs, slicer profiles, schematics, and such on GitHub for anyone who is interested in looking deeper. And if you are trying to build one, I would be happy to answer any questions about it in the comments of this or any other video about it. As I said above, I do hope that soon I will make a video talking about setting up tool changes on Clipper, but I don't know when that will be coming out. I do hope you enjoyed this video, because it was a lot of work making it. If you did, then leave a like, and if you want to stay in touch for any future videos about this or any other project, uh, please subscribe and activate notifications. And that's about it. I hope to see you in another video, and goodbye!